thank you for being here today. What a great group we have today. What a great crowd we got. And we want to welcome our Femic Island campus. Would you give them a big hand right now? Welcome, guys. Thank you for joining us here on Mother's Day. And everybody online, if you're watching via Facebook right now or YouTube, thank you so much for watching and share uh, our services with other people. We sure, certainly would appreciate that. So we're glad you're here. We're in a series uh, called Showdown in Egypt, but today we're going to take a break and talk about uh, ladies today. This is a special day for uh, all the ladies that are in the house. So we want to take a little bit of time to talk to moms, but I want to broaden today's message, not just to moms, but to ladies in general. And... Uh, what I want to do today is to talk to different types of ladies that are here today, different types of ladies that are here today. I think Mother's Day becomes sort of tricky for some people because there's a certain stereotype of what, you know, a mother is and do you fit in that? And so Mother's Day can be very painful for some people, but we want to talk about the different type of women. And this is not going to cover everybody. Uh, and I know already that I'm going to miss some categories, but uh, maybe that's for next year. But I just wanted to talk to some special uh, ladies today and talk to them a little bit. Here's the thing. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but there are eight, 383 car brands, 383 car brands. You got, you know, you got your Chevrolet, your Ford, your uh, GMC, you got your BMW, you got all these different brands of cars, 383 different brands brands of cars, but uh, they're all different, but yet they're still all cars. And when I think about women, uh, there are a lot of different types of women that are part of today's service. Uh, maybe a better uh, metaphor would be flowers. I don't know if you understand, uh, know this, but there are 350,000 flowering plant species. Uh, I've got uh, some beautiful roses in my front of my house. This is uh, me sitting on the porch looking at these uh, roses. Uh, they're so easy to grow. I bought them at Lowe's a couple years ago, put them in the ground, and they're just like flourishing. But there's all kinds of flowers, uh, chrysanthemums, uh, you know, daisies, roses, tulips. That's about all I know. I about exhausted my knowledge of flowers. Different types of flowers. But uh, at the end of the day, all are flowers, different types of women. So I want to talk today about different types of women that may be here. First category I want to talk about today is women with no children, women with no children. Uh, there are always people on Mother's Day, there's ladies that do not have children. And uh, that's a big category. I remember years ago, I was preaching on Mother's Day, and I, one of my points was uh, that uh, one of the types of mothers is a mother with empty arms that doesn't have a child, that wants a child. And uh, I remember having a couple come up to me and said, we almost didn't come today, but that helped us so much to hear that, that that, uh, that was acknowledged. And so there are women who don't have children. And some of those women have decided to not have children because of career or because of calling or mission. And then you've got ladies that can't have children, that really want to have children, and they cannot seem to have children. And I think Mother's Day is especially hard for those type of women that think, boy, I want to have a child, and I can't have a child, and that becomes their all-obsessive focus in life. They're all obsessive focus in life. In the Bible, there are so many barren women. It's one of the major themes in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. You've got Sarah, of course, the wife of Abraham. Her whole narrative, the whole narrative of uh, Sarah's life is trying to have a child and she couldn't have a child. And she's just living in decades of frustration, and finally she has Isaac, and uh, it's just a painful thing. But one of the most interesting sections of Scripture is about in 1 Samuel where this woman named Hannah couldn't have a child. And she was struggling dramatically. And um, in those days, you know, there was polygamy. Uh, the, her husband, Hannah's husband, her, his name was Elkna. And he had two wives, Panina and Hannah. And uh, the Bible doesn't endorse polygamy, but, you know, we know from the creation story that you have uh, God created Adam and Eve, one woman for one man, uh, but things sort of got messed up. But what we do see in the Bible, whenever you see polygamy, you see all kinds of problems. And so Hannah couldn't have a child, and, but her rival, Panina, could have a child. And she was always sort of like uh, pushing back on Hannah, and Hannah was just always so upset. And it says uh, 
It says this, it says in uh, verse uh, five, but Hannah, he gave, this is Elkanah, when they went to the Shiloh, the temple, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed the room. Because the Lord, verse eight, six of uh, 1 Samuel one, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and could not eat. And then uh, Elkanah said to her, you know, hey, don't worry, am I not better to you than 10 sons? And she said, really not, you know, so anyhow, one of those deals. But her, she's living in anguish because she could not have a child. And she's struggling with that. And I think that represents a lot of women on, on Mother's Day. And we have Elizabeth in the New Testament and all that. Here's the thing I want you to hear today. If you're here and if you're listening online and you can't have a child, not having a child does not make you a second class woman. Not having a child does not make you a second class woman. How many know that there are no such thing as second class people, that everybody is first class in God's sight? Can you say a big amen? And so when you think about women that are in that category that can't have a child, uh, that is something they wrestle with. There's a great uh, Seinfeld scene where uh, Jerry and Elaine are trying to uh, book a flight and the flight got changed or whatever. And they have two tickets on this flight and there's a first class and a second class. And Jerry takes the first class and he's sitting in first class and Elaine is back there in coach. And she's su- struggling and suffering. A lot of you have seen this, uh, this episode. And I think people that can't have, uh, women that can't have a child many times feel like that. And I just want to say to you on Mother's Day, you are not a second-class woman. And you have to recognize, and we all have to recognize, that God is sovereign over every aspect of our life. That God has a plan for us. And often I quote Charles Spurgeon's quote that says, uh, God is too good to be unkind, too wise to make a mistake. I cannot always trace his hand, but I can always trust his heart. And I want you to know if you are a woman today without a child that you can trust the heart of God. God has a purpose and plan for you, and that's very, very important for you to remember. God has a race for every woman. God has a purpose for every woman. When I graduated from Bible college in Pensacola, Florida in 1981, at my graduation, the uh, speaker, Ken Summerall, who was the president of the college, uh, used this text for the graduation service. And I've never forgotten it. It's been over 40 years ago. And he said, uh, he preached out of Hebrews 12 verses one through two. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and, run, and the sin that so eagerly and easily entangles. And let us, listen to this, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Everybody has a race marked out for them. And if you are without a child today, wherever you are, whatever you're thinking, maybe you've dreaded Mother's Day, I want you to say that God has a race marked out for you. God has a race marked out for you. In the book of 1 John, or not John, 1 John, but John, uh, John 21, we have Jesus in telling uh, Peter, you know, when you get old, he says in verse 18, uh, when you get old, uh, when you were younger, you could do whatever you wanted to. But when you get old, you're going to be incarcerated and you're going to be led from place to place. And Jesus is basically prophesying over Peter that this is going to happen to him. And then Peter looks at John and he says, what about him? What about him? And Jesus basically says to him, you know, hey, listen, that's none of your business. You know, listen, the path and mission of other people is none of our, mis- uh, none of our business. What is our business is understanding our mission. And everybody has their own mission here in life. And that's very important for us to remember. If you've ever seen a Olympic swimming pool uh, and where there's races, one of the things you'll see in Olympic swimming pool is blue lines that are painted on the floor of the swimming pool. And those blue lines are for the swimmer. So the swimmer can look at the blue line and not have to look over their shoulder to where the rope is and where the other swimmers are, but the, the swimmer keeps their eyes on the blue line and they swim that blue line because that's the lane that they are supposed to be in. 
So we have to remember that when we are called to uh, a life, and sometimes people do have children, some people don't have children, we all have to focus on the blue line that we're called to swim in. And that's an important thing for us to remember. Karen and I uh, took a bike ride the other day. It was a little windy last Saturday. So we went to Trap Pond and we did the little five mile uh, ride through the woods there and the little trails. And you watch the trail there as you're riding at Trap Pond and it gets really narrow certain places and there's some bridges you go over and you just have to follow the trail. It's got a lot of twists and turns, but you have to just stay on the trail. And so when you think about your experience as a mother or as a woman, you follow the blue line. You follow the trail that God has for you. And you are not, I want to say this one more time before I move on to the next next point, you are not a second-class woman. You are not a second-class woman if you can't have a child. Uh, You are first-class, first-class, and God has his hand on your life. Eugenia Harrelly, I don't know who she is, I found this quote, She says this, do yourself a favor, never compare yourself to others because comparison swallows your God-given gift. Because comparison swallows your God-given gift. And so if you're looking at other women that are having all these children, you got Fertile Myrtle living next door to you, (laughs) and you can't get a child, you want to swim your blue line. So that's the first type of woman I want to mention today. God has a plan for you. And I want you to say this with me. If a woman does not have a child, she is not a second-class woman. Important for us to remember that. Second type of woman. I've never heard this spoken about on Mother's Day. Second type of woman is a woman who's lost a child. A woman who's lost a child. And uh, last night I was uh, invited to go to Glen Burnie, Maryland, uh, to give a talk. And there's a lady in our Fenwick Island campus, uh, Jerrica Myers, that one year ago on Mother's Day, her 32-year-old son died. And so Erica asked me last week if Karen and I would come up to a banquet and speak uh, to honor her son. And uh, she did an incredible job as she kind of orchestrated that that banquet to honor her son, uh, uh, Manuel, a wonderful guy and a very talented uh, computer engineer, smart, smart guy, and he just died unexpectedly on Mother's Day. And here's what she said. She's lost a husband. Uh, Jerrica's lost a husband. She's lost her parents. And she said, the pain of losing a child is completely different. The pain of losing a child is completely different. So on Mother's Day, there's always uh, mothers that have lost a child, and that's a very, very uh, significant thing for a lot of people. And then there's also people that have miscarriages, and most of us know people that have gone through that. Maybe you've gone through that yourself. Uh, Out of 100 women, out of 100 women, 10 to 20 women will lose their child. 10 to 20 women, that's about 10 to 20 percent. And the 10 to 20, 10 to 20 percent that lose a child will always lose that child in the first trimester. And you know what's, what happens is there's this, uh, there's this thing that uh, I think people on the outside think, well, listen, you just, you know, you, you just were barely pregnant. How can you grieve over that? Here's the thing. As soon as a woman hears that she's pregnant, she becomes a mother in her heart. As soon as a woman hears that she's pregnant, she becomes a mother in her heart. And I've seen women that, you know, have been pregnant for, you know, four or six weeks and they lose that child and they go into incredible grief. And all of us know people like that. And so that's an that's a incredible, difficult thing for people. And so people, uh, there's ladies in Fenwick Island, uh, such as Jerrica. Uh, there's ladies here today. There's ladies listening online that have lost a child. And that's a very, very painful thing. And what do you do with that? How do you process that? One of the people that I've been inspired by in my ministry over the years is Zig Ziglar. Some of you have heard Zig Ziglar before. If you're a business person and you've gone to conferences, you've probably heard Zig Ziglar somewhere along the line uh, and positive speaker. He died a couple years ago. But Zig Ziglar, I, had the pro- I think it was in Philadelphia, got to hear him in person. And he's the most optimistic, uh, you know, uh, just really positive person. You go 
to Zig Ziglar, you hear him speak, and I used to listen to his, his audio books and would listen to his speeches, and he just inspired me. But Zig Ziglar was, as he was uh, in, uh, later in life, his, he lost a daughter that died of pulmonary fibrosis, which is some type of lung cancer. And she was 46 years old. Her name was Susan. And this positive speaker, positive speaker, Zig Ziglar, uh, went into grief. He went into grief. And he uh, wrote a book called Confessions of a Grieving Christian. And here's what he said. He said this. I'll never forget. I heard him say this uh, on YouTube or somewhere. He said, you know, he said, parents are never supposed to bury their children. Children are supposed to bury their parents. And he gave some advice. He was interviewed about how to get through grief. But here's one of the things he said about grief I thought was really incredible. He said this. He said, uh, grief is not only unavoidable, but desirable because it brings us to the point of realizing the vastness of our love and puts us in a position to trust God alone for our restoration. Grief is perhaps the most profound way of expressing love. The more we love a person we have lost, the greater our grief. So when I stood before about 50, 60 people last night in this banquet room, and I was talking to Jerrica and her family, that still a year later after grief, there's no, there's no time watch on grief. You can't say you're supposed to be over it by now. It's no such thing as that. But when I, when I stood before this mother who had lost a son a year ago on Mother's Day, I said, the grief that you have and the pain that you experience periodically as you go through life is always a symbol of how much you loved your son. It's always a symbol of how much you loved your son. And if you grieve for somebody, the more you love them, the deeper the grief and if you've lost a child, certainly you know how to de how that, what that's like. Here's what Zig Ziglar says. He gives some counsel about how to deal with your grief. First of all, he says, give out of your grief. Give out of your grief. Now, the thing that we want to do when we go through a real uh, loss in our life with losing a child, uh, we, we want to just sort of crawl into our own little world. But Zig Ziglar says, want to make sure that you give out of your grief. He says this, when you yourself are hurting... Give what little joy you have, and it will return to you. So that's an important principle. And when I work with people that go through grief and uh, grief that we all have experienced, it's so important that we acknowledge what we're feeling, what we're going through, but that we also step out of our world of pain to help somebody else. And I've told you many times, my dad told me when I became a pastor, he said, if you ever get discouraged, you ever get depressed, go to the hospital and walk down the aisles and go in rooms and visit people. When you do that, you'll feel your heart being filled back up. And he is absolutely right. And you've heard me say this a million times, you cannot help another person without helping yourself. So Zig Ziglar says in his grief, he said, make sure that you give out of your grief. Um, I'm a Downton Abbey fan. I've mentioned it before. You either love Downton Abbey or you hate it. And some of you love it. I love Downton Abbey. I like the characters. I like the story. I like the theme of change. Uh, there's, a, there's a scene in this show, I don't remember what season it is, where uh, Matthew Crawley has died. He's the one that married Lady Mary. He's died in a tragic car accident. And his mother, Isabel Crawley, is completely in grief. She's shrouded with grief. She's shrouded with sorrow. And her friend, Violet Crawley, the Dowager Countess, says... There's a man in the community that's sick and he really needs someone to care for him. And Isabel, you're a nurse. Why don't you take this man into your house and help him? And she says, I can't do that. And she says, Violet says, that's what you were created for. And she brings that man in the house and she serves him and it helps to pull her out of her grief. So Zig Ziglar says, make sure that you Give out of your grief. Share your grief is the second thing. He says, make sure you talk to somebody about your grief. Look to somebody that has listening ears and an understanding eyes that understands your world and share your grief with another person. I did a, an AA uh, funeral a couple of weeks ago or a month and a half ago, I think it was. I've told you about it uh, a couple of times, I think. 
And there was about 100 people there uh, from the AA uh, organization. And the man that I was doing the funeral for was a leader in the AA organization. And before the funeral started, I saw all of this, you know, camaraderie and fellowship and communion and hugging. And there was an intimacy and connection in that group of people such as I've not seen in many situations before. And it occurred to me the reason that those people were so close is because they had shared suffering together. And when you share suffering with another person, <clears throat> it helps you be connected with them at a deeper level. So share your grief. Here's what uh, Ziegler, Zig Ziglar says, shared grief builds and deepens relationships. And over time, a deep relation gives freedom to share grief. The next thing is, uh, he says, keep talking about the one you've lost. Keep talking about the child. Continue to say their name and continue to talk about uh, how important they were to you. And as I talked to that uh, group last night, I said, you know, when you talk about uh, um, Manuel, make sure that you continue to tell stories about him. You continue to say his name because talking about the person keeps those memories alive, and that's an important thing. And Harold Ivan Smith says, a person ceases to exist when two things happen. We cease to say their name, and we cease to tell stories about them. So that's an important part of grief. And then Ziegler says, buckle up, buckle up. He said, listen to this, the grief journey is like a roller coaster that you, can, that you can ride, but you cannot steer. And what that means is, is that sometimes when you're in grief and you've lost a child, or if you lost somebody important in your life, that you're anticipating a certain moment and you think that moment's going to be terrible, it's coming up on an anniversary or something, and you anticipate that's going to be really bad, and you get to that point and you don't have a lot of emotion. And then another time where you're not expecting anything, out of nowhere, you're plunged into this dark grief. Grief is very random and very unpredictable. And so you have to just sort of understand that. And then he says, here's what you do. Uh, by the way, I wanted to mention, I, I recommend this movie to people. Um, I don't know if you know who Melissa McCarthy is. She's a very funny person in a lot of movies. Um, but there's a movie on Netflix. How many people have Netflix? I think everybody in the world has Netflix. Just raise your hand if you've got Netflix, okay? Netflix, there's a movie called The Starling. And it's about uh, a couple that loses a little girl. And uh, excellent movie. Uh, it's powerful. And it really gives a good, good understanding of what grief is like when you lose a child. And that's an important thing. Ziegler says then, he says, uh, choose what you're going to think about. He says his, little, his daughter that he lost, the 46-year-old daughter that he lost, was, was, her name was Susan. And he said, I can lament the fact that I will never hear Susan laugh again, or I can be thankful for every time I got to hear her laugh. And then he says, finally, pick three, pick three memories and put those memories in your database, your mental database, and think about those memories like a treasure chest full of jewels. Every person, every child has wonderful memories and you pull those jewels out and you think about them. So that's a type of woman that we sometimes neglect in, uh, in, in Mother's Day. And uh, great scripture in Jeremiah 31 Rachel weeping, this is our Jeremiah 31, 15, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Big theme in scripture there. So the next type of, uh, next type of woman that we want to talk about, so you got the woman that doesn't have a child, you got the woman that's lost a child, and then you've got single moms, single moms, now, I could ask you right now to raise your hand if you're a single mom, but uh, Family College campus, this campus, watching online, lots and lots of single moms, lots and lots of single moms. How many single moms are there? Well, 2021, there were around 15.62 million families in America led by a female householder. Now, there's a graph. I want to show you a graph. This is a graph. This shows you the, uh, the trend of single uh, moms. I think we have a graph from 1990 to uh, 2020. We have that graph or not? There, I've got it up here. Here it is. That shows you the, the growth of single moms in America. On this end is 1990, 
and on the far end is 2020. In the last decade, single moms have become dominant parental figures. So it's a big deal. There's lots of single moms and single moms that are trying to uh, navigate and how to, how to do that and all the responsibilities on them. Are there any single moms in Scripture? Well, there's a couple that are really significant. One is in uh, Acts chapter 16. Her name was Lydia. Most scholars believe that she was a widower, that her husband had died somehow. In the ancient world, life expectancy was very, very short, and your husband could die, and just like that. And, you know, a lot of women were in a situation if their husband died, they didn't have any financial means, and they would quickly remarry. But this was a woman that had a career, and uh, her name was Lydia. And let me read a little bit to you, just a couple of verses here. Acts 16, 13 through 15. On the Sabbath, uh, we went outside the city. This is Paul and Silas on their second missionary journey uh, to the river where we, we expected to find a, pla a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listing was a woman of the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to our home. So this is a woman that uh, probably was a widower, and she's a seller of purple cloth, which means that, you know, that in the ancient world when you uh, wore purple, it was a sign of uh, wealth and prosperity. So this woman was a merchant. Somehow she developed this, this uh, cloth company where she sold, sold purple garments, and she was incredibly successful, and she was able to support her family on her own. And uh, she was very, very successful. And I just can imagine when her husband died, that her life became so unstable. And this woman found incredible stability. She had a career. She was educated. She had uh, the ability to put a business plan together. And she was very successful. And she had her household. And she's seeking the Lord. And she's uh, hungry for the Lord. And she finds the Lord. She influences her children. And she's a beautiful picture of a single mother, a single mother that's following Jesus and is successful. And I just think it's a wonderful thing when women have an education. If I had little girls and I had daughters, I'd make sure they had an education. I'd make sure they had an education. I want them to marry a good man, love them, take care of them, but I don't want them without a parachute. I want them to be able to take care of themselves. And this is a picture of Lydia being able to do that. And she, uh, you know, she, her, I, can't, I don't know what happened in her world, and I don't know what happened to her husband, but, I mean, all of a sudden, things are out of control, and she's got to survive on her own. I remember when I was uh, in high school, I had my first car, 1969 Chevrolet Nova, and I'm riding. I had bald tires, and I'm riding down to Salisbury on 13 from uh, Seaford to Salisbury, and it's rainy. And I hit a patch of water, and I start losing control. My car's fishtailing, and those bald tires, I'm just spinning around. And uh, ended up in the medium somehow and, and didn't get caught by a cop and was able to move on. But um, I think that that's what a little bit like what a woman feels when her husband leaves her and he abandons her. We have so many women at a Rehoboth campus, this campus, other campuses, that they never banked on being alone. And they, uh, they you know, the husband ran off with Amber, the cocktail waitress. And I've seen it over and over again. These women stand strong and the Lord helps them. And it's not the ideal situation. It's not what they signed up for. But the Lord gives them grace and they get through that. And there's some women in our church that are raising kids all by themselves. And we just need to say, well done, well done, well done. You're doing a great job. And look at you, girl. Look at you go. Can you say a big amen to that? So I think that's good. That's a good thing. So that's, uh, then we got another single mom. We got, uh, we got uh, Timothy's mother. She was a single mom. Uh, Acts uh, 16, verse 1, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystria, uh, when, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. And in the original language, it's clear, Greek scholars say, that when it mentions his father was a Greek, the tense of the Greek indicates that, her fa that the father was probably dead. 
So she's a widower, and she's raising one of the greatest young men that's going to influence the early church. My son, Tim, is named after Timothy. Um, and uh, this woman raised this boy, this little boy that became Paul's companion. And the last letter Paul wrote, he wrote to Timothy, who was raised by a single mom. And an incredible, incredible story there. So then we got, um, we got this. We got the mother of children married with a spouse. That's my world. I'm married to Karen for good night, 45 years, 45 years. We've been married a long time. She's with our boys today uh, down at Rehoboth because, uh, of course, Joel pastors down there. So she's down there with Joel. Said, you want to hear me? You want to hear Joel today? She said, I'm going to go hear Joel today. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm absolutely thrilled she's down there. And my other son's there. He serves in the church. And we are, we are a nuclear family. And we are a husband and a wife staying together loving Jesus, working through stuff, working through stuff. You say, you look at me, you say, oh, Pastor Danny, you're like, uh, you're like, man, you and Karen are just awesome. Well, when we first year we got married, it was awful. It was just awful. We were young and we were, I couldn't get her to listen to anything. And I, she wouldn't get me to listen to anything. And it was just, we were just praying for Jesus to come or one of us to die. I mean, please. <laughs> but... We stay together. And the Bible, the Bible holds up this ideal of husband and wife being married together and having children. It's the ideal, and it's, it's something that the Scripture assumes in the New Testament. Book of Ephesians, chapter 5, you know, wives, be submitted to your husbands. That means kind of be sensitive to his leadership. Husbands, love your wives, which is a radical concept in that day. Well, you know, husbands, you know, they had their wives to have children and they had concubines and mistresses. And Paul's calling them to a, mono a monogamous type of relationship. Totally new, brand new. Women were elevated in the New Testament world. They weren't, you know, I had a, a college professor, a female at the University of Delaware, and she says, you know, I, d I don't, can't buy the New Testament because of Paul's, you know, he was a misogynist. He was just such a negative man on women. It's just, it's just not true from the understanding of the context that they were functioning in. But what you see in the book of Ephesians is husband, love your wife, wife, you know, work with your husband in a partnership, be sensitive to leadership. And then chapter six, you got the husband and the wife. And then the next thing mentions children, children obey your parents. The picture in Ephesians is a nuclear family. And in Colossians, nuclear family, same thing in Colossians. Uh, Colossians uh, verse, uh, three, chapter 3, verse 18, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And then verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So you got wives, husbands, children in the same little cluster of verses. That's the ideal. So... Then you got, how about this one, this, this proverbial woman. If you ever read uh, Proverbs 31, that wonder woman, you know, she like makes clothes and she's working in the field and she's cooking food and she's canning and she's like her husband sitting in the city gates. I guess he's just sitting there with the city gates and she's doing everything. But then that is probably an ideal woman. And it says in Proverbs 31, 28, her children, speaking of this wonderful woman, her children will rise up and call her blessed her husband also. So you got a husband and you got a, a wife and you got children. And then how about this one? How about the early church? I got a bunch of verses here, but the early church, when they're choosing an elder for the church, when they're choosing a spiritual leader for the church, what type of person do they choose? Here's a trustworthy saying, whoever expires, this is uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. Here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now an overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife. And it literally means in the Greek, a one woman man, eyes for one woman, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not giving to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. First, verse four, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. So when the early church set up, 
what you're going to do for a leader, what's a leader look like in the church? He's a husband married to a wife that manages children. So that's the nuclear family, and it is held up in Scripture. And I would say, with all the different types of arrangements we have, we don't want to throw out the ideal. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have a landline? How many still have a landline? You have a landline. Raise your hand if you have a landline. Raise it real high. That is something. That's awesome. How many do not have a landline? Raise your hand. Raise it up. Wave your hand if you don't have a landline. It's really interesting. When we got rid of our landline, uh, it was really hard. You know, Karen, you know, couldn't let it go. And I said, hey, we don't need it. You know, we didn't answer it. Anyhow, it rings. We just don't answer it. You know, I said, why do we have this landline? And uh, so I finally talked her into getting it, getting rid of it, and we wept and cried as they carried out the door. <laughs> and most people don't, a lot of people don't have a landline. Some of you do for good reasons. But, you know, the nuclear family is not like a landline. It's not something that's going to go out of style that we should never embrace. But it's a wonderful designed by God that he puts together a man and a woman and they have children together and out of having those children they together raise those children the husband has certain temperament certain certain uh, certain uh, certain personality that bears on the children the wife has a certain temper and personality that bears on the children. So you've got these two different personalities and gifts that come together that like two hands making pottery mold something beautiful. So that's God's ideal. If you are not living in the ideal, God's grace is with you. If you are a single mother I wouldn't say run out and marry the first guy you see running down the street. I would say be very careful. Make sure you're wise about that. But God's grace is with you. And God's grace is with you if you're, you know, you know uh, in a situation where you don't have the ideal model. But the ideal model is not something that we want to throw out because it takes the best way to raise kids many times is two people because it's exhausting. It's exhausting to raise kids. How many have had, how many grandparents we have here? You raise your hand, your grandparents, and you have your grandkids with you? And are you glad when they leave? Just, just confess if you're glad when they leave. <laughs> you, well, you would never say that, but you know, whoo, you know, I've seen the lights of Paris, I've seen the lights of Rome, but there's nothing like the tailgates, uh, the taillights of my kid's car taking my grandkids' homes. That's what you're thinking, you know. <laughs> but... I got this, uh, this grill the other day. Uh, I got this, uh, it's like a Blackstone grill. It's made by Sam's Club. And, and so I ordered it and uh, just loved this. It came in a big box, heavy box. And I was uh, going to put that thing together. And Karen was off doing something. And this thing had as many parts as the space shuttle. I'm telling you. <laughs> And I'm trying to hold things. I'm trying to, you know, get the thing, you know, hold up a bar. And I just get things, parts, certain parts of it were heavy. And I'm laying on the floor and I'm not thinking godly thoughts. And I'm trying to get this thing together. And then Karen comes in. I said, hey, could you help me do this? And so for the next couple hours together, we rolled up our sleeves and we put that thing together. And, you know, to be honest, a lot of times I just had her do things. And I was drinking iced tea. It was really wonderful. <laughs> But together, together, it was really a lot easier. So if you're married and you're working through stuff, stay with it. Raise those little kids together. Your kids need to see you. The greatest gift you can give your kids, the greatest gift you can give your kids. If you're a father here today, you're a dad, the greatest gift you can give your kids is to love their mother. That's the greatest gift because children feel safe when mom and dad love each other. Children feel safe. They feel healthy when mom and dad are loving and supporting each other. So I want to just 
end by praying for all the ladies that are here today and whatever category you're in. If you've lost a child, God loves you. If you can't have children, you're not second class. If you're doing it all by yourself, you're not really doing it all by yourself because the Lord is with you. And if you're married and you're hanging with your hubby and your guys are doing it together, well done, well done. That's a good, good model because it's in Scripture. Would you lift your hands? Let's pray for families today. Lift your hands high to the Lord. Everybody in Femic Island right now, lift your hands up. Let's let the Holy Spirit minister. We pray for comfort from mothers that are hurting this morning. We pray for comfort. This is a place of comfort. This is a family, a spiritual family. We're so glad that they're here today. They came in their pain, and they're here. We pray for those women in pain in Femic Island, those who are listening online. And we pray, God, for those single moms who give them wisdom, grace, prosper them, give them good paychecks, give them good places to live. Take care of them. Help them. Let them feel your strength. Let them remember Lydia. Let them remember Timothy's mom. Let them remember that God can help them through this time and they can be successful. And we thank you for loving us. And we bless the ladies here today. In the name of Jesus, give them health, give them strength, give them joy, give them peace. Let them have spiritual influence. And we pray that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. And we give thanks to them. For them, we give thanks for how they enrich our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. 